All right, so welcome everyone. My uh, uh, name is Miriam Arad. I am a professor of immunology and hematology oncology at Mount Sinai Medical School, where I direct the Precision Immunology Institute. I'm also the president-elect of IORS, and it's my pleasure today to serve as a moderator of a seminar given by Dr. Rachel Humphrey, entitled What Cancer Immunologists Are Doing About COVID-19. So Rachel was trained at the NCI as a medical oncologist. She's currently serving as a head of research and development for Thio Bio Ventures. She's also a board director and chief medical officer of all uh, the Thio Bio Ventures funded uh, biotech company, including 12 well uh, therapeutic. Prior to that, she served as chief medical officer for Cytomex, a biotech company based in South San Francisco, where she supervised the clinical development of probody therapeutic for the treatment of cancer. And prior to this, she, uh, she had various senior uh, level role in cancer drug development, including senior vice president and head of the immuno-oncology at AstraZeneca and Vice President of Clinical Development at Bristol Myers Squibb, where she led the clinical development of ipilimumab, also called anti-CTLA-4, for the treatment of cancer. She has many talents. She sings and acts. She's the lead singer and co-founder of a band called The Checkpoints, a blues band made, of, made up of luminaries in immuno-oncology, including the Nobel Prize uh, winner Jim Allison. She's also featured in a movie called Jim Allison's uh, Breakthrough, which, we, which was released in 2019 and described her role in the development of CTLA-4 uh, antibody blockade. So welcome, Rachel, to IUIS sponsored COVID-19 seminar. It's a pleasure to have you today. I am very much looking forward to your talk and to the audience, please feel free to ask questions using the chat features. I will be collecting questions during the webinar and I will add them uh, uh, at the end of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Humphrey's talk. Welcome, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Before I get started, I want to offer many thanks to Olya Finn my friend and professor at Pittsburgh who invited me to participate. I want to thank Dr. Murad, another friend who is serving as a facilitator. I am honored to be here with you. I also want to thank Karina and the team at IUIS and Frontier for setting this up. So today I'm going to be sharing some good news from behind the scenes and also in front of the curtain uh, in the COVID epidemic. Uh, we hear frightening statistics in the news every day, but behind the scenes, and that's the curtain I want to draw for you, there is a ton of stuff going on. Doctors and scientists with all sorts of expertise are putting their heads together. Um, and in fact, maybe surprisingly, the uh, oncologists have a role to play. So my goal today is to frame the discussion that's accessible for all of you. If you know a bit about the immunology um, and the immune system, consider this a refresher and I try to set it up for you in the context of the talk. For those who don't know the immune system at all, don't worry. I've simplified it down greatly. Go with the flow. It's all going to make sense. I promise. So, um, doctors who focus on um, doctors who focus on treating infections and those who treat cancer have been helping each other for centuries. I'm going to spend a little time on this slide, a little bit more on this slide than any other, because the history is super interesting and it really sets the tone for the discussion we're going to have today. The pivotal element is the immune system which, as we'll see, may very well cross the boundaries of specialties um, and are at the heart of the, the successes today in um, the COVID pandemic. So let's go to the top left. 20, 224 years ago, almost to the day, the anniversary is coming up on the 14th, Edward Jenner exposed his, gardener, his gardener's son, James Fitz, to cowpox. And then he challenged him with smallpox, something that I think IRBs today would have some trouble with, but maybe not. Um, the bottom line is he wasn't sure what he was doing, but he assumed that humors 
surrounding all of us inside our body somewhere can be trained against specific infections and protect the boy, protect us. He was right uh, for reasons he didn't quite understand, but guessed that, and he ushered in a period of uh, vaccines that remains today. 100 years later, almost to the day, go down now, William Coley was a, a surgical resident in um, New York. Uh, he lost a good friend, Bessie Daschle, who was a Rockefeller. She was 18 years old. She had a little thing on her finger. He cut it off and then it spread wildly, turned out to be a sarcoma. She died very quickly. He was bereft. It's a very famous story. Maybe some of you know it. He went down to the bowels of New York Hospital, scoured the uh, charts, found multiple patients whose sarcomas went away in the context of a nasty staph infection over the tumor. One of those, a German immigrant named Fred Stein, he went out to the tenements, he met him, and the scar was completely clean, and the guy was 10 years out and went on to die of something else. So he reasoned that there's a humor inside the body that can be trained, not just against infection, but also against cancer. So he took live Staphylococcus, live replicating Staphylococcus, injected it into the sarcoma of 10 patients. Some of them died of infection, but some of them did well. And there are examples in his entire series where he claims about 30% benefited of patients who went on to have complete remissions and die of other things. A famous merchant marine apparently died of alcoholism years later. So that was the first example where the immune system, something they were using as early as 1796, um, was around. They just didn't know what to call it. And it ushered in a period of centuries where people tried very hard to understand what exactly was working. And in fact, the amount of data became so onerous, onerous is not the right word, that doctors divided and conquered. You take infection, you take cancer, let's study the immune system, see how it goes. So the top of the slide is infectious disease, and you can see in 1938, the first flu vaccine was administered to soldiers in World War II. They didn't want to repeat the pandemic of the Spanish flu in 1918. It didn't work so good. In fact, flu vaccines now work a whole lot better, but it was a start. Um, go 50 years later, now go back down, and Steve Rosenberg at the NIH, a surgeon, by then, we understood the T cells. Cells were important in the immune system as we tried to tease out what Coley was doing. And he wondered whether T cells were responsible for some of the anti-tumor immunity. So he took out, he surgically resected tumors, pulled out the T cells, um, grew them up with cytokines, a word that's very important. We'll come back to it later. Grew up um, um, in the test tube with cytokines to vast numbers beyond what was there before, injected them back into patients along with some cytokines and saw a response. Not in everybody, but he saw enough biological activity to believe that something was going on. Around the same time, the AIDS epidemic reminded us that viral infection and cancer are aligned. The tumor on the bottom is Kaposi's C sarcoma, but lymphomas are very common. In fact, AIDS patients can get all sorts of cancer types if their T cell count is low enough. It's notable that the people I'm going to talk about today were all roughly trained in medicine during the AIDS period. We're all in our 40s and 50s, and our exposure to medicine during our residency and internship were wards filled with immunosuppressed AIDS patients, our oncology fellowship, wards filled with oncology, um, with immunoinfectious cancer patients. Um, and so it's no surprise that that cohort of doctors left that training and wanted to know more. Skip now to 2011 when ipilimumab is approved based upon the science of Tasco Hanjo, called Hanjo, and Jim Allison. Both of them won the Nobel Prize in this picture because they identified antibodies and targets that could do what Coley was trying to do, do what Steve Rosenberg was trying to do, do what people were trying to do for 100 years years, 200 years arguably, to um, save the lives of patients with cancer and even potentially cure them. And as you heard, there's a movie about Jim and you can get it on PBS. Enter the coronavirus and we're off to the races. So in the next slide, 
we talk a little bit about what's happening now. And you may or may not know this, maybe you're participating in it. Physicians in the PIP field are carefully recording the natural history of the disease. Scientists are grabbing clinical samples and dissecting the biology. There's a whirlwind of hypotheses, a whirlwind of drugs that may or may not work. Clinical studies are opening, finishing, being published, and resulting in approved drugs in weeks. And potential therapies are moving from good idea to routine use. There are medicines in the pantries um, that have not been successful in the development, but somebody thinks maybe this will work, and in some cases it does. So what happened next? Okay. What happened next? My friend Paul Goldberg at the Cancer Letter, he knew of my work in Ipilimumab. We've been friends for years. He calls me up and he goes, I think your friends in immuno-oncology are making a difference. Go figure it out. Go to your band. And this is a picture of the band. Again, we met in 2007. Immuno-oncology stalwarts, some of whom trained together. Patrick and I were at Hopkins together. Um, all looking at the immune system, all believing the immune system worked in cancer before anyone else really caught on. Um, and, uh, and now, years later, they're all experts in the field and some of them are luminaries. Patrick Hu on the right is the head of oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Tom Gajewski on the left is head of immuno-oncology at the University of Chicago. There's Jim in the middle, our uh, resident Nobel laureate who arguably started the whole thing in many ways with Anjo. Jed Walchuk over at the left there is head of immuno-oncology at Sloan Kettering. And others are seeing COVID in the field and using their understanding of the immune system to make a difference. So these are naturally the good people to talk to. It may be interesting to know that in the band, during rehearsals, we're routinely talking about science. It's a community of, um, it's a cool place to be. Jed Walchuk and his colleague, um, Santosh Vard Hanna, published this week a seminal paper on the immune system in the virus and oncology. Um, uh, the reference is in the slide deck, and I recommend that everybody take a look at that seminal paper. So what did I do? I structured interviews. I asked them fundamental questions. What are you seeing? What are the ongoing hypotheses that are driving the clinical knowledge? What's your own scientific work and how is it playing a role? And what do we know of the rapid evolution of medicine in your ongoing work? So let's dive in. First, the basics. And again, don't worry whether you're an expert or not an expert, you'll be okay. So the immune system can be divided a number of ways, but today I'm dividing it in the following way. The innate immune system, which is the activator, and the adaptive immune system, which is the army. The innate immune system is stimulated, starts to churn in the context of tissue damage, whether that damage is from cancer, locally or distally, metastases, or just growth within the tissue it's born in. Uh, but also nasty bugs can cause tissue damage. I think part of the COVID uh, virus challenges has to do with the damage to the uh, tissue that gets introduced to the virus. And then through mechanisms, the innate immune system, the activator facilitates, recruits, amplifies multiple arms of the immune system in the adaptive setting. And it works through cells and also cytokines. The adaptive immunity is the army. It's trained by the innate immune system to target specific individual foreign proteins, whether it's cancer or infection. It regulates itself, it goes up, it goes down, it can get tired. And there it works for the T cells, the very same T cells that we've been talking about on this earlier slide, as well as B cells, which we won't be talking much about today. The activators and the army. The innate immune system doesn't care what it's chewing up, these tissue, chew activate, go. But the adaptive immunity it cares very much what it's doing. The innate immunity breaks up the tumor, breaks up the virus, and presents pieces of those proteins to individual cells, which now know what to do and go do their work. This next slide is the famous Melman Chen immuno-oncology cycle. Let's start at the bottom. Tissue damage, roughly seven o'clock, that's number one. 
starts the whole thing. Again, whether it's virus or cancer, here it's cancer. The innate immune system scavenges the detritus, which is called antigens, and releases the recruiting cytokines. The antigens are um, uh, used to train the T cells to recognize specific elements of the tumor. They or they go toward the tumor, they penetrate the tumor, they bind to the tumor, they kill the tumor, they create more dirt, and the cycle goes again. On the next slide, we look at the same story in the vaccine. This is a picture from um, uh, Jed and Santosh's paper. Here we're looking at an alveolus, which is the end piece in the lungs. It's the place where the oxygen is exchanged between the blood and the air in the lungs. It's seminally important, and when it gets injured, obviously bad things happen. When things work, the innate immune system sees the damage by the virus, puts out elements that bring in macrophages. Macrophages put out IL-6 and IL-1 beta, which recruits neutrophils and CD8 cells to do the damage to virus-infected cells. When it works well, it moves quickly, effectively, and in all the bacterial and viral infections we've all had in our lives, this is what's happening. So this is the best case scenario. Again, it comes from Santos and Jed's paper. The red is the innate immune system, it comes up first. It stimulates the adaptive immune system, which comes up next. And the virus or the cancer gets impacted in the way I've described. There's one other piece here that I haven't talked about, and that's the flattened part of the blue line. When all goes well, those T cells that have learned to recognize the cancer or the virus will stay alive for a very long time and provide memory. So that patients with cancer or patients with the virus won't see either of those again. So what is oncology teaching us? Here's the famous Melman um, uh, slide. This time though, it's populated with all of the elements that oncologists have been, and scientists, very important, have been bringing from the bench to the bedside for the immune system. It represents a wealth of understanding in the details, the fine details of the immune system. The green ones, when those targets are, um, uh, hit with antibodies or other therapies, they stimulate the immune system directly. The ones in red remove breaks. Not all of them are approved or work. Some of them are working, some of them are approved, and I'll focus on those today. But the reason I show you this is because there's just a lot of work behind the scenes that people who are experts in oncology are paying close attention to. So the ones we'll talk about are squared here, CPLE4, ipilimumab was the first to show um, life extension in melanoma. When it's combined with the other one, the PD-1 and PDL one pathway, it's particularly effective against some tumors. Uh, we routinely see um, data emerging in different cancer types. But even as a monotherapy, the PD-1 and the PDL one inhibitors are extremely effective and have become a centerpiece of therapy in oncology. Again, reinforcing that not just science and Doctors in academic centers are using the immune system, but every oncologist understands the immune system now. In the next few slides, I'm gonna show you how it works um, and why we feel so good about immunotherapies. Two slides. This is nivolumab, an anti-PD-1 antibody in patients with lung cancer. For those who don't know what a Kaplan-Meier curve is, here's two sentences. All the patients line up at the beginning on the top left there, 100% of them are living. And every time a patient dies, the line goes down. So the faster the deaths, the quicker the line approaches zero. And you can see here that the dose axle arm, which was the standard of care at the time, um, those patients aren't doing as well as the nivolumab patients. And in fact, at 12 months, you could see that line in the middle, 42% of patients are still alive or estimated to be alive in the nivolumab arm and about a quarter of the patients in the dose arm. Moreover, at roughly 18 months, the nivolumab patients stop dying. It's also true of the docetaxel patients, although there's not very many patients in that series, but it's believable because we see that in other immunotherapies, maybe even docetaxel is working as an immunotherapy in this setting. The bottom line is the memory is taking over and the patients are protected. Here's pembrolizumab, 
in lots of cancer types. If you don't know what a waterfall plot is, even though it looks like filled in shapes with a magic marker, in fact, this is made up of lots of tiny lines, each representing a patient, sardined next to each other so that this helicopter view, it looks like they're one story, but in fact, they're ordered in the line of the change in their tumor burden. So down is shrinkage, up is growth, and uh, the patients who have the best tumor shrinkage are all the way to the right, and the ones that have the worst growth are all the way to the left. Um, you can see it works in all of these cancer types. There are lots more that are not on this list. The bottom line is more than half of them in most of these cancers do well with Pembro monotherapy in selected patients. The Hodgkin's disease patients are clearly all doing well. It's very active in lymphoma. This is a very exciting time in oncology. The immune system is important and we're learning a ton about it because when you show activity against the cancer with the immune system, when you rev it up, it also revs up against normal tissue. On the left is a man who before he got an anti-PD-1 treatment, this is a patient who um, looks very much like a typical patient. Uh, his lungs had some cancer in it, but was still quite um, uh, bright. After four doses of an anti-PD-1 treatment, I think this is pembrolizumab for his metastatic melanoma, his lungs are now filled with fluid. That's inflammation, and uh, that patient is not doing well. Patients just like him go on the ventilator. Many of them die. That looks like COVID lung. So while the virus may very well be causing that by direct challenge, there's no question, oncologists who are pulled in to care for COVID patients, either because the patients have cancer and are in their own clinic, or because all hands are on deck and oncologists are being pulled in to treat just anybody, will say, aha, there might be something there I need to pay attention to. Let's look at another immunotherapy. I didn't show you this on the Melman um, Chen slide, um, but these CAR T cells are basically souped up, activated, pre, um, trained outside the body CAR Ts. They are patient's cells now engineered with all of those targets in there, not all of them, but lots. Immune stimulator targets are in there, immune break blockers are in there. This thing is the atomic bomb of T cells. It takes Steve Rosenberg's idea from the 80s, soups it up significantly, and you can see on the left here in the Zuma-1 study, 82% of B cell lymphoma patients had um, some response. They would have been down on that waterfall plot. 54% of them had complete remission, and most of those, all of those were alive at 18 months, presumably from memory, although further follow-up is important. And there are case studies of further follow-up where patients continue to do well. So the CAR-T doesn't need to be activated by the innate immune system, go straight to the tumor, focused on the tumor because the CAR-Ts have tumor targeting elements in it also. It's a full service T cell, breaks down the tumor and creates dirt. But when things work well, it all moves quickly and patients do fine. But a lot of patients don't do fine because when you rev up the immune system and you create a lot of that detritus, now you've got the innate immune system on full scale, fully revved. IL-6 comes out, IL-1 beta comes out. Now you have real problems. 83% of patients getting CAR-T therapy um, across studies, this is a meta-analysis, um, had any grade severity, it's also called cytokine storm. 51% of them were very severe. 25% of them needed vasopressors to keep their pressure up. 13% were intubated patients died. You get fever, chills, hypotension, dyspnea, hypoxemia, and the IL-6 levels skyrocket. Normal is in the hundreds. This is terrible. So oncologists who are coming in to treat COVID patients for a variety of reasons go, aha, this looks like COVID crash. Maybe the IL-6 levels are high. Maybe something else that's happening here is also happening in the COVID patient. And they'll say, we have a treatment for that. So tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, was originally 
approved for rheumatoid arthritis, which again is another example of therapeutic specialties sharing with each other. Here, the rheumatologists hand it over to the cancer doctors and go try this. And in fact, 69% or 31 out of 45 patients with cytokine release syndrome came off, came off vasopressors. And on the basis of 45 patient study, the regulators who are supportive when the data look good said approved, fully approved in the formulary, right to prescription. Checkpoint inhibitors like CTLA-4 and PD-1 have pneumonitis and all sorts of other inflammatory events. It looks like IL-6 may very well work in patients who are not responding to steroids and is a standard of care. And then other immunotherapies like CD3-based bispecifics are also looking to see if IL-6 matters. Now, there are toxicities with tocilizumab and other IL-6 um, suppressors, and we shouldn't forget those. While they happen uncommonly, they're real and they're life-threatening, and they're listed at the bottom of the slide. And the reason I point those out is because while we're very excited about tocilizumab and there's lots of good reason to use it, we have to remember that not everybody benefits and the relationship between risk and benefit really does need to be understood before we um, confirm our enthusiasm about the drug. So what does this mean for COVID-19 patients? I've talked a little bit about this, but I'll go into some detail. What do we see? with COVID patients who get really ill. They get symptomatic breathlessness at four to seven days, which is actually longer than the flu vaccine that usually takes only a few days. So the length of time with the virus may matter. And even then when they come into the hospital, they're not intubated right away. So some doctors are thinking maybe this isn't so much an acute infection as a subacute infection and that might matter. And again, acute respiratory distress syndrome is bilateral lung infiltrates, hypoxemia, artificial ventilation. Um, until recently, most of the patients who got tubed um, died from the challenges imposed. Now, the, the virus itself may be causing lots of harm, but we already knew that IL-6 mattered in this setting in subacute infections. So you've seen the one on the left. Now let's look at the one on the right. Here, when the virus lasts a while, and the macrophages do their duty and IL-6 comes out, the level of IL-6, the level of IL-B1 begin to create challenges with the neutrophils who um, express all sorts of um, proteins that break down the lining of the alveolus and really cause challenges. So it's not impossible to believe that IL-6 matters here. And the most important thing that oncologists and viral doctors needed to do was measure the IL-6. And in fact, tocilizumab looks like it works. There's a series that was published from the Chinese uh, physicians that was started in February 5th, finished on February 14th, <clears throat> published shortly after that, and the Chinese authorities have already approved tocilizumab. It's in the formulary. Doctors in China can prescribe it. In their series, 75% had improved oxygen function, 91% had improved lung scans, 91% were discharged from the hospital relatively quickly, and there were no obvious toxicities here. In preparation for this presentation, I called my sister-in-law. She's a uh, very good oncologist in Richmond. I wanted to understand what's happening with TOSI in her practice. She said they're using tocilizumab in buckets, bucketfuls, are words. And as an example, one of her colleagues, an anesthesiologist who got very sick, was on the verge of being intubated, got a squirt of tocilizumab and two hours later asked to go home. Now again, not everybody benefits like that. And the relationship between risk and benefit needs to be better understood. But obviously when you're on the verge of dying, the question really isn't, is this gonna work or not? Um, and in fact, Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, CITSI, has guidelines and recommends tocilizumab for hypoxia with elevated IL-6 levels. And by the way, the elevation of IL-6 levels in COVID is not nearly as high as cytokine storm with CAR Ts, that might matter. Nevertheless, it still works. There are guidelines available in multiple clinical settings and the Vidant Health language is in that reference below. There are other hospitals also, clearly Richmond isn't on the list, I learned it was through a phone call. And there are ongoing randomized studies both in Italy and the US. Paolo Asierto um, has done a lot of work here, um, posted his um, success, his early successes on LinkedIn. I don't know about you, but that's where I learned about his 
his work, and he's reportedly going to be publishing his uh, series in the next few days. So what do we mean? You've seen the picture on the left. Now let's look at the picture on the right. On the right, the innate immune system pops up and doesn't come back down again, maybe because the virus is prolonged. The T cells exhaust themselves. The white cells in the circulation go down. There's no chance for memory here. And the relationship between the innate and adaptive immune system, that choreography is now dysfunctional. The immune system is not working as it should. And whether this is a virus or an oncology patient, uh, the viral infection persists, the cancer infection persists. This is a very pretty picture to start thinking about therapy. Do you reduce the <clears throat> innate activation at the right time? We know we can with tocilizumab. Do you bump up the T cells at the right time? Well, I've already told you that T cell stimulation causes pneumonitis. So what's the right thing? And we are standing today, <clears throat> on today's date, May 4th, without all the answers. But now you know the questions. And we're going to get into those questions now so you can tune your ears for the answers as time proceeds. So let's talk about IL-6. I've already explained to you, you need it for the viral response. So if you give it too early, does the virus persist? Is the IL-6 inhibition causing challenges? Maybe the patients get off the vent, but what happens after that? We're learning. What are other elements of the immune system doing here? Maybe IL-1 matters now. You inhibit IL-6, which is causing the damage, and IL-1 still does its thing. Nobody knows. Those are sentences that are not proven, but we need to think more about it, and lots of people are. We need to inhibit both of them because there are patients who are not responding to tocilizumab. We need to inhibit IL-1 too. People are looking into that as well. And what about the timing? If we give IL-6 early, is it going to cause harm? I would say probably, but I don't know. Um, if we give it late, who knows? Let's talk about the T cells. I've already talked a little bit about that. Is it good or bad? On the one hand, we know it works. It's important. It's the army. They need recruitment, facilitation, maintenance. Maybe increasing T cells is a good thing. Maybe increasing it early is a good thing. Maybe preventing um, uh, exhaustion late in the course is a good thing. I don't know. But COVID pneumonitis may be from T cells. Maybe T cell stimulation should be avoided. Maybe PD-1 inhibitors in cancer patients should come off, not on, when a patient with uh, cancer on a PD-1 agent gets, can't, gets uh, COVID. So what do we know today on May 4th, 2020? Jed tells me that at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they have a wide <laughs> excuse me, um, experience with patients who um, are, have cancer and are on PD-1 inhibitors with COVID. It looks like the lung cancer patients do badly anyway, so it's hard to tell. And in the other pan cancers, it's not clear. Doesn't look like it's causing harm, doesn't look like it's making things better. That's not a formal investigation. That doesn't talk about everybody's experience. Oncologists around the world are looking into this. Not at all clear. The NCCN guidelines will eventually come out. We definitely need more data. What about differences between the patients? What about viral load? Maybe if you get a ton of virus with your first exposure, the tissue damage takes you to a place that no immune response is going to let you go. I just heard this morning that at a Missouri pork processing plant, 370 people were positive for COVID and all of them were symptomatic. Usually about half the patients, quarter of the patients, depends on where you look, don't have symptoms at all, all of them because they're standing next to each other. Maybe they're not, um, they don't have their mask. Who knows? But wear your mask, avoid people, because who knows what the viral load is doing here. What about advanced age? You cell immunity reduces in advanced age. That's why my elderly parents are locked in their house. Not locked, of course they're not locked. But they're in their house. We bring them food. We lay it on the porch. They spray it with, with bleach. They bring it in. I want them safe. I want your parents safe. I want all of our loved ones safe. Please wear a mask. Please be careful until we know more. Concomitant cancers change your immune system, whether you're on an immunosuppressant or not. Immunosuppressants for autoimmune disease, they change the T cell milieu. That may matter as well. What about the microbiome? Something we've been looking at in cancer for a while. 
Tom Gajewski and others have been spearheading this. Bugs in your lungs and other parts of your body look like they change your immune system. Maybe there are bugs in bacteria in some people's lungs that are protective and not protective in others. So here's what my friends are doing. Here's the answers to the question, what are you doing? And this is just a small example of what's going on behind the scenes. These are the people I talk to. Tom is looking at biobanked patients from the COVID infection and comparing them to biobanked serum from pneumonitis patients on PD-1. He's looking at the microbes to figure out how it impacts the outcome. He's looking at germline polymorphisms. Maybe people are different in a meaningful way just by their genes. He's looking at the T cell and antibody responses in real time. Jason is looking at the thousand patients in his catchment area. Doesn't matter if they're infected, doesn't matter if they're symptomatic. Anybody who comes into the clinic for whatever reason gets tested. He's looking at serological analysis of cytokines. And my friend, um, Dr. Murad, is on this list as well. She works at uh, Mount Sinai, which is one of the hardest hits institutions in the US. She's also looking at patients for a detailed array of immune profiling, which she and her team spearheaded for the rest of the world. Others are looking at other things. John Timmerman at UCLA is looking to see if the serum of patients who have recovered are helping. Uh, he's doing this in collaboration with the folks at Johns Hopkins. Lisa Parker at the, Lisa Butterfield at the Parker Institute is making sure that the informatics technology is circulated sufficiently so people have the tools they need to dissect what they're learning. And my friend Dirk is actually taking his oncology hat and moving it to infectious disease directly by working in ferret models, ferrets get COVID, to see if you can block entry of the virus into the host cells through ACE2 inhibitors. So what are we looking for? Vaccines to prevent infection. We hear maybe they'll be available late in the year, early next year, fingers crossed. There's lots of work to do to make sure that they work properly. We want them to work. Antivirals like remdesivir to clear the infection. Remdesivir works, it has biological activity. I'm not sure it's fabulous. It doesn't work in anybody, in everybody, everybody. It, uh, it changes the course of infection, but maybe in combination with other therapies, it's exactly what the doctor ordered, we'll see. Other antivirals are in development as well. Immune impacting agents, perfecting the choreography to restore the balance. Everybody's going into their pantry to look to see if they have something that lowers cytokines, raises T cells, does it in the right time. We wanna maximize the antiviral effect and minimize toxicity. Real heroes are the healthcare workers on the front line. These are people who are putting themselves in harm's way, greeting you at the door at the emergency room, even though you think you have COVID, walking into your room in the hospital when you have COVID. These people are making us and our loved ones safe, and they're not safe themselves. They're wearing masks, they're doing the best they can, but I hear that a thousand people in the Sloan Kettering system have tested positive. Some of them have gotten very ill. We need to really respect what the work of these people are doing and give the gratitude they deserve. So humanity will prevail. The right people are looking at the right things. We are in the middle of a terrible pandemic that's changing our lives, but I believe that we're gonna get through this with all hands on deck. I'll now take some questions. I see a question. Um, I see that uh, somebody wrote um, homeopathy is a um, maybe difficult. I am um, using different words. I think that's probably right, but I would not underestimate the importance of taking good care of yourself, doing what's right to eat well and uh, maintain your own healthfulness. And to be fair to those who care very much about homeopathy, I have to say it hasn't really been formally tested and um, I don't discourage anybody from paying attention. But I would say don't avoid good therapies that we talked about today because you're on um, homeopathy. 
Somebody asked, um, what is my view on Ayurveda and herbal medicine? Um, I think I've answered that question already. Um, many thanks to the kind words that are coming through also. Um, all strains of COVID-19 have the same virulence, question mark. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I think it may be um, a, a mixture. Um, these questions are coming very fast now. I think Miriam has access to them. Uh, vaccine designated to treat COVID in a broad spectrum target or serotype specific. I don't know enough about the vaccine work, uh, but I imagine that the folks who are doing this now are using vaccine, understanding vaccine technology to do the right thing. Interference in COVID-19, um, I think at the end of the day, it's part of the general question. Are they good? Are they bad? Interference is part of the innate immune system. Um, I think what we need to do is, uh, is keep learning. Combination of IL-1 and IL-6, I talked about that earlier. Sorry, IL-6 and IL-1. Um, I don't know the answer to that either. I can only say that the question is whether you're interfering too much in the antiviral effect or appropriately um, managing the innate immune system. And at the end of the day, uh, I think the timing probably matters. Um, we're looking into this now. Mutation for the virus. I think that's a good worry. I don't know the answer to that either. That's a question that I think folks are paying attention to also. The list of things that are going on is just what I learned in my small sample. Uh, but that's an important question in HIV. Um, uh, viral uh, mutation matters. But I would say that in cancer, cancers mutate also to get away from the immune system. And a lot of these nonspecific stimulators and nonspecific activators um, of, uh, of damage don't really care about the antigens on the surface of the virus, so we're probably okay. Anticoagulant, it's a really good question. Looks like only in the last few days I'm hearing, we're hearing that um, strokes in young people and hypercoagulability are important. Um, and there are those that are thinking that anticoagulant should be a standard of care. That doesn't necessarily need to happen. And the question about the relationship between the immune system and the hypercoagulable state remains to be seen. It is true that the Novartis trial on anti-IL-6 is disappointing. Agreed. That may mean that with more information on a tocilizumab, we see a different picture. When you treat more patients, you get usually a softening of the activity, but we don't know if there are differences between those antibodies. We're learning that antibodies, even though the targets are the same, the antibody structure itself may be meaningfully difficult, different. Plant antiviral therapy, again, I don't think anything's off the table, but be careful because not all herbal or plant-based therapies are good. And again, we're learning that medicines can stimulate what you need to stimulate and hurt what you need to hurt. I would be uber careful. I would take only those things on clinical studies or that have proven efficacy. This is just too serious to be experimenting yourself. Um, again, Thank you very much for uh, your kind words. Smoking, a risk factor. I can tell you that patients who have lung cancer, who have smoked, most of them have, don't do well with COVID. The damage that's already there is causing challenges. Lung cancer and smokers, stay in the house, cover your face. Um, the differences between, uh, I do speak French, so the Spanish, French one I get, the question about BCG, BCG is an immune stimulant. Um, at, at the end of the day, it may very well be helpful, not helpful, uh, but it's something to pay attention to. Oral polio vaccine, I think that person is asking what our friend William Coley asked. If you stimulate the immune system against infection, are you doing something good? It's a good idea. Again, I wouldn't try anything except in a clinical study with uh, thoughtful attention and IRB approval. Um, the ACE2 inhibitor study, I can't say very much more except that information about the entry of the virus into cells appears to be mediated in part by um, ACE2 and blocking that doorway may very well be important. 
Um, I think the plasma therapy someone's asking is uh, potentially important. It's too early to tell. We're hearing stories that antibodies may or may not protect. They clearly protect in some, they don't protect in others. Uh, but in 1918, plasma therapy was being used. So it is not new and it looked like it was working. It's a great idea. And the question is whether it will persist as a good idea. Um, don't ask me about bioterrorism. I honestly don't know. All I can say is that the people in Wuhan were um, tragically injured by this, this virus for whatever reason. And, um, and the rest is history. We can only keep our um, attention to, um, uh, to the work at hand. Protease inhibitors against SARS-2 protease is promising. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that, but it again reinforces the learning from HIV to cancer, to other infections, and that cauldron of um, understanding can only be good. PH17 cells uh, in severe COVID, that's a good point. Again, there are elements of the, of the infection that we continue to look at, and that's as good as any. Is immunotherapy 100% successful for cancer treatment? Thank you for that question. The answer is no. The PD-1 therapies, monotherapies, impacts about 40% of melanoma patients as a monotherapy, about 60% of melanoma patients in combination with HIPI. In other cancer types, the response rate of uh, PD-1 alone is 15 to 20%. There is a lot of work to be done. Rachel, uh, and, oh, sorry, Miriam. <laughs> You're there. We had problems, you know. This is I know. We covered. Yeah. Although we practice, I can tell you all. Oh no, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. You have questions for me. All right. Can I take? Can I take over a little bit? The questioning. This I was hoping going. you would. I was struggling. <laughs> I was missing some. <laughs> you did so well. I have to say, I almost oh. didn't uh, didn't try to come back. Sorry, oh. so I, I have listed some questions that came back uh, regularly. So one big question was about plasma therapy. Do you think plasma therapy could work, uh, Rachel? Um, you know, that they are re using serotherapy from patients that recovered, and, and, and there has been several questions about this, whether this could be a good strategy. What do you think? Ah, so lots of people asked the question. I, I answered it a little bit before. Uh, serum therapy is not new. It was being done in uh, the early part of the 19th century with the Spanish flu, 20th century. And, um, uh, and it's a good idea, but uh, there's no guarantee because uh, immunity from antibodies uh, may not be perfect. Yeah. What other questions do you have? I love questions. There, there were several questions about uh, the fact that COVID-19 is not as prevalent in several countries. So there was a question from Nepal, a question from Iraq, and then a question from India that cases are now you know, starting to really expand. So the question was, do you think whether prior BCG uh, wow. uh, vaccine or smallpox vaccine, smallpox, that's also something that's coming up in the late press, are, are, have any protective effect on, on COVID-19? So it's really interesting, and I know Olya's online, <clears throat> but one could argue that exposure to lots of infections um, over the course of time or um, vaccines over the course of time may in fact create a milieu that's supportive of the immune system in general. And it may very well be the differences we're seeing in uh, different countries, different states in the United States may relate to exposures to vaccines and other diseases. But I think there are other things that are also contributing. The density of people may matter a great deal. We talked earlier about genetic differences between patients, microbiome patients, um, uh, features. Uh, when you live together, you get exposed to the same bacteria in your lungs. Some of those are gonna be supportive, some of those are not gonna be supportive. I think it would be difficult to attribute any of these differences to um, specific elements. But I would advise around the world, don't assume because the rate is low that you can stand in front of someone who's coughing. If you don't know if they're positive or negative, if you do know they're positive, please don't stand in front of people who are coughing because there are still deaths around the world. There are still people being impacted and we cannot take this lightly. Yeah. So would you say, Rachel, because there was a question whether we should start to vaccinate ourselves with oral polio and 
BCG vaccine, should we say no? That's not a good idea right now. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, is it possible that you're diverting the army with an acute vaccine? I don't know the answer to that. Miriam, you may have more information. I don't know enough. I don't think anybody knows enough, but I would encourage everybody to test whatever their great idea is in the context of a clinical study with a physician who's paying attention because doctors around the world are revved like they've never been revved in their lifetime. Absolutely. Uh, Rachel, there were several questions about IL-6 blockade. Uh, so, you know, uh, some are disappointing. There was some discrepancy between uh, the trial performed by Regeneron, you know, with Sarilumab, and uh, yeah. an early result from the Tocizulimab, uh, the Roche uh, antibody that was, I think, released by the French. So, uh, can you comment on, on this IL-6 blockade? So, I talked a little bit about it before, but I'll just say a word now. The bottom line is that even though antibodies go against the same target, they're not always the same. There are other pieces of the uh, antibody molecule that may matter because the activity of IL-6 may not be completely through the signaling cascade. It may be through other mechanisms. But I would also caution, this is really a lesson we've learned in oncology for the longest time. Early data does not always predict late data. And the question about whether it works at all is a reasonable one. That anesthesiologist did well, but what about the other seven anesthesiologists that uh, came into the hospital? At the end of the day, we need large randomized studies that can look at the relationship between toxicity and efficacy. And we may discover that the story with tocilizumab is more complicated. If I had to guess, I would say it is more complicated. We just haven't been exposed to that yet. Yeah. Okay, so there are several questions about different, this is so herbal therapy or the sulfur in the air. I mean, uh, should we be... Oh, in the the air. Air? I saw one about steam. Mm. Let me say a word about steam. And I'm really not joking here. I am not joking here. And a word about other things like uh, strong um, alkaline agents or strong acid agents. Um, your lung is a very sensitive tissue. Uh, I can't say for sure that steam, which is not always harmful, doesn't help, but um, there's no evidence that it helps. It can't cause harm. But uh, again, my advice is not to take very hot material or very pH low or high material to try to clean out your lungs the way you might clean out a, uh, a desktop. Uh, um, so I'm not comfortable with that, but not as uncomfortable as, say, bleach. Yeah. Uh, there are some questions about herd immunity. Do you think herd immunity will kick in at some point and how fast? Right. How so herd immunity is very interesting. And I'm reading a lot about that, just like you're reading a lot about that. And I think it gets to at what point do enough people have protective antibodies and protective memory. Because there's an uncertainty about the level of protection, um, I think at some point between the vaccines and those patients who have achieved immunity, um, I think uh, it may very well be that your likelihood of being exposed to somebody who's positive is gonna drop. It just is. When it drops sufficiently, how will we know it's dropping sufficiently? It's very hard to do. And uh, um, I do not envy the politicians and other folks who are trying to figure that out. This is extremely difficult. It doesn't matter which side of the political fence you live on. Um, if we're not sure whether people are um, immune or not, if we're not sure who's immune or not, if we're not sure who is exposed or not, um, it's going to be very difficult. But do I believe herd immunity will eventually uh, prevail? I do. Yeah. So there is questions about uh, the antiviral antibody. I think Regeneron is making one and potentially some other. So do you think this is, uh, uh, you know, there's some hope in this type of treatment? I think this was the same treatment that was successful against Ebola. Uh, and they're supposed, I think, to start their trial in June, July. Is it a valid type of therapy? 
Um, actually, I was distracted by a French question that I was trying to get through. Could you just repeat the first two words of your question? Uh, yeah. um, so, you know, Regeneron is developing an antiviral antibody. Oh, yes. I think an antibody okay. against got the spike protein. And they That's were right. wondering whether, yeah. That's right. This. I think it's good news. Thank you for that. I think it's good news. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, I think it's good news that multiple groups are looking at different vaccines. I told you earlier that the flu vaccine in 1938 did not work very well. If you look up on Google the history of vaccines, you'll learn a great deal. And the core question about which antigen is going to make the most difference is going to matter a great deal as well. So I cannot predict which ones are going to work. I'm hopeful that one of them will. Um, somebody asked the question about vaccine, about um, viral mutation. I don't know anything about the rate of viral mutation. It's believable that the virus may be slightly different in one person than another. Uh, we know that in the normal flu um, seasons, uh, not all the viruses are exactly the same. So I'm cautiously optimistic, but I don't want to make any promises. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about pathogenic IL-17. I don't know whether you re you you responded to this while I was hexicling trying to come back, but whether IL-17 can be pathogenic and uh, and contribute, in fact, to the damage that we are seeing in some patients. Sure. And um, Santosh and uh, Jed's paper suggested maybe IL-7 can be helpful here. Uh, and acetyl cysteine might be helpful here. Uh, there are a whole host of immune um, impacting agents that may be causing harm and may be um, uh, doing well. Um, I, uh, I, would, I would simply say that no immune modulators off the table, but the caution needs to be applied because I've already told you that PD-1 might be good, PD-1 might be bad, immunostimulants cause harm, immunostimulants cause um, success. Uh, so uh, I heard the other day from a cancer patient who said, well, if I go on Nevo, I'm going to have a better immune response. Uh, I think that's an oversimplification, and that's probably true for all immunostimulants. I don't know, Dr. Murad, if you have uh, thoughts about that too. I know that's your no, I, I, agree, I agree with you that first we don't uh, we don't know and, and there is a conundrum in these uh, uh, questions because we need the immune response and then we need to block it also and that we have to be very careful in not oversimplifying what we're going to do. So we need to learn more and, and really profile as many patients as possible and not assume that this uh, uh, damaging inflammatory response is the same as the one that we've seen in other, uh, other viremia or other CAR-T and really study the patients as much as we want, as we can. There was a question also related to this, which is, should we be thinking about interferon therapy in patients with very early disease, for example, healthcare workers? Um, right, and I, I think I saw something about nasal um, interferon. The nasal, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, again, I think something that's going to increase the T cell response early on in the infection may very well be helpful. And again, lots of folks, including people who are close to me, are looking to see if early application of T cell stimulants in any setting is going to be helpful. I think it's a good idea. Um, and in fact, if I was going to look at the things that I think should be done early, I would say early application of T cell stimulants is probably the best bet but I would do it very cautiously. I probably would not apply a um, something to shut the innate immune system off early either. Uh, you guys all know about how the choreography matters, uh, and I'm no expert in that regard. I don't have a crystal ball, but based upon everything that I've seen, I think that's the best bet. I don't know, Miriam, if you have a thought on that as well. Yeah, so, so we will be starting, in fact, an uh, uh, interferon therapy. In fact, we are going to use interferon lambda. It's interesting, interferon, so type 1 interferon are the ones that are most antiviral, but interferon lambda uh, receptor expression is a little bit more restricted. So we think that using lambda will not cause the immunopathology that can be caused by interferon alpha and beta, which also simulate the immune system. As you know, Rachel, interferon alpha is a very good way to induce a strong T cell response, but also activate macrophage, activate DC, etc. So we just got the approval from the FDA to start an interferon lambda therapy in very early patients, and we are quite excited about this, and we will be profiling these patients, in fact, in my laboratory. So I'm quite excited about this. Uh, 
Great minds think alike. Exactly. You and the person who has the question. Excited. <laughs> So, uh, Richard, there was a question about the chance, the chances of relapse after we yeah. recover and, and still spreading the infection after we recover. And I think this is also a, a question that's very uh, you know, present in the community, of course. So what do you now, think? I'll, I'll answer and then invite you to answer as well. Um, we're definitely seeing patients who continue to be positive. I saw something recently that maybe those tests are looking at fragments of the virus. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know for certain. Uh, from the presentation and the, uh, the study that I've done here, it looks pretty clear that in, when the choreography of the immune system is dysfunctional, uh, lingering virus may very well happen. It makes sense based upon what we know for the immune system. I would exercise caution. I don't want to tell somebody who is COVID positive a month ago to still stay in their basement. That's not fun. Uh, but I don't think enough is understood about the clearing of the virus under some settings. And we are seeing patients whose fevers are coming back. Uh, yeah. My other understanding, Jed told me this the other day, uh, that um, there are there is a subset of patients who, if their symptoms begin to come back, uh, there's no guarantee they won't do poorly. Yeah. Even if they didn't do poorly up front. Mm -hmm. Wear your mask. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so there was some question whether previous immunity to flu or other viruses, and I'm going to link it to another question about our own immune system, how patients' own immune system or potential immune exposure can have can really contribute to disease outcome. Uh, so maybe we, like, I suppose, uh, is past, uh, is influenced our past and, and past exposure to to disease, I suppose it's the same with the with the BCG or polio, or uh, is it influencing uh, the, the response to the disease? So I don't see why not. Again, um, exposure to other infections. William Coley applied staff, um, but plenty of his patients did not benefit. I think there's uncertainty. What may help one patient may not help another. Um, I would. Um, be very careful uh, again in implying, implying and applying something that might stimulate the immune system. By the way, I just saw something about whether feces contain intact virus. Uh, in that paper by um, uh, Santosh and uh, by Walchuk and uh, Bardhana, they actually talk about viral inclusion bodies in organs as well as in the feces. So um, lingering virus does not necessarily mean only in the lung can be in other places as well, which may be why GI toxicities are among the side effects that we're seeing with, um, with COVID, uh, because the virus is impacting multiple organ systems. Yeah. I will add to this though that we still don't know whether it's infectious, right? So when we find the virus, uh, you know, it's unclear whether the, the, the virus is infected, mm -hmm. is infected. Uh, and this is what people are, are several groups are starting to uh, really uh, try to understand. So, and the way to do this is that they will have to take that virus and then culture it and in plaque assay and see whether it's infective. For the stools, it remains to be seen. Although I agree with you, Rachel, I several studies showing that there is viral inclusion potentially in uh, enterocyte, and it will be it's important to know whether uh, you are shedding uh, infected. Uh, in, in infectable virus. However, there was a question whether we have flushing, I suppose, um, can uh, can aerosolize. Uh, well, I will say, um, yeah. Maybe oh, closer. dear. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's a good question. I, I, I don't know. You were in the middle of the question. <laughs> Close the lid. <laughs> Close the lid and the plug. Yeah, where are you, man? I think we are past the hour. Um, I'm trying to see here whether we need to close. There are still many questions coming in. You've been a phenomenal success, Rachel. Everyone's saying thank you. Uh, this is very informative. Very nice presentation. Um, ah, someone is saying many public restrooms without lid. Mm, that's true. <laughs> uh, sure. All right. So what should we do? Should we stop? Should we continue? I'm asking the no, organizer here. Uh, please comment on BCG vaccine trial expected outcome for COVID-19. Um, 
wonderful to see the two of you discussing. I don't know either for BCG vaccine. Um, you know, I, I think, as, as you mentioned, Rachel, we have to be a little bit careful here. There is a correlation that was made between potential BCG uh, protection and, uh, however, the risk, as you said, is we divert the response. We need a response, again, the specific epitope and uh, uh, thinking that, you know, that we share it, it's possible, but uh, we have to be careful in science. It's a big statement to say that BCG vaccine could be protective. It needs to be studied. Right. And um, right. yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, groups trying to develop vaccine or try uh, develop antiviral antibody therapy. Maybe these are better uh, bet um, than, than starting a, a BCG therapy, you know, which has a, its own... Uh -huh. Uh, potential issues, right, and side effect. But let me say this: no idea is bad. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why this is so exciting behind the scenes is that a lot of smart people on the phone and off the phone are doing what they can to think creatively. Um, these are all good questions, every one of them, and the hope is that through supportive regulators, activated physicians activated patients, thoughtful people in the community who are all eager and moving in the same direction, help us, and work together to ask these questions formally. Because I want to just reinforce, when you just apply something and you think it's working, you don't know if it's working because the cosmic twin of the person you gave it to is not sitting next to you, not getting the therapy. And patients do get better on this drug. And anecdotal attention to what looks like it's working and not working can be dangerous. We have an example of that with the hydroxychloroquine. In at least one study, patients did worse. But anecdotal attention to it early on made it look promising. You don't know. Be careful. Ask questions. Yeah. Wear your mask. Yeah, and follow the science, I suppose. Right? We need to study patients. Right. Yeah, for, right. if we study patients, this is a new disease, so we need to study patients because maybe there will be a subset of patients responding and another subset not responding. Maybe the large subset will not respond, and yet we will learn from the small, as we've seen in immunotherapy, right? There is a small, a, a still a small subset that responds for cancer immunotherapy, and it's teaching us a lot and, and helping us develop novel immunotherapy regimen. So study the patients and I think follow those clinical studies where there is no biological endpoints are much less interesting, unfortunately, than those with real biological monitoring efforts to really understand why things go well or not. So there's a lot of literature always read that, uh, you know, the biological endpoint that they've measured and try to correlate. And hopefully this is how we will learn about the IL-6 trial and the discrepancies potentially the remdesivir, it's important to look at it also critically, right? And chloroquine and all of these drugs. Right. <laughs> so I, I I think we probably Slowing need down. to- <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, but Thank there you for your questions, questions, everyone. Yeah. All right, Rachel. So I think we are going to stop here. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Uh, you know, given uh, all the thank you note, I think everyone appreciated your insight. Someone even okay. said, can you come back, please, in a few weeks to give us update? Thank you very much, Dr. Rachel Humphrey. Thank you very much. Okay, so I invite you to come back on uh, next next month. No, well, not you. I was going to present the webinar, but Rachel, I think by popular demand, you will come back and maybe even sing for us at the end of the oh. seminar. Maybe we can go on, even go on YouTube. <laughs> So the it's next seminar is um, next Monday. Uh, Andreas Radbrox will be talking about adaptive immunity in COVID-19, and the moderator will be Rita Carsetti. So with this, I would like IOS and Frontier Immunology uh, very much for allowing us to really make this presentation. In fact, in the middle of a pandemic, it was quite difficult to get it one lined up. Uh, and uh, thank you again to Faith Ozier, the president of IOS, for, for starting this initiative. I know Faith, this is, has been, uh, you know, quite uh, you know, difficult to, to put in place in, in such short notice, but thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you, Rachel, again. Thank you, Olya, for inviting Rachel to present today. Yes, thank you, Olya. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.